All right, so hi everyone, welcome to this edition of episode of Writers in Fusion. I'm your host, Susan. I'm here with Ed, behind the scenes, right now he's invisible, uh, Jen, Dave, and Julie. Uh, we're here with our guest writer, Robert Kahn, at the um, Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. So, <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming today. We're going to have Robert read his story, and then we'll stop the critique. Uh, so I titled this The Killing, uh, and the summary is uh, the submission is mostly autobiographical at around the time of sixth grade. Uh, it is a mix of memories. Uh, it came as a single event early one morning, uh, and I was compelled to write it in the voice uh, of which it was delivered. Uh, growing up in the 50s, what would a kid really know about World War II residing quietly around us? Not much. Nobody wanted to talk about it. At the movies and on television, we watched how our guys won the war. They had been home for a while, but not saying much about it. In my uncle's top dresser drawer, I found a black and white photos of him and his war buddies and some old bullets. He wouldn't say much until a long time later, he did speak of how they set up camp his first night just off the Normandy beaches and how he was tripping over things in the dark. The next morning he saw what they were, dead Germans. But that was nothing, he said, as passing dead GIs when they moved out the next day. The war left reverberations, and they could be felt, if not understood. But America was settling in. We were the winners. Walking around in those days, you would think it was an all right neighborhood. Auburndale, a section of Newton, a suburb of Boston. Moving there from a basement apartment with painted concrete walls to the upstairs of the two family, it seemed we had arrived. We came from Brookline, which was concrete hard. Out there, there was space. Excuse me. Out here, there was space. Sky, trees, dirt, and water from an inlet of the Charles River. People fished there, but caught mostly sunfish. They were greedy and stupid and thrown on the banks to flop die and stink in the summer sun. At the end of my street, just before the river, was the woods. It was down there that the killing happened. Johnny Dee lived in a small house with his mother and aunt. He was told his father worked for the railroad and was killed on the job. Johnny didn't have much of a memory of his father, but was made to feel proud of him. He had a paper who was the first person to come to our door and welcomed me to the neighborhood. When I was at his house, his mother and aunt always seemed stressed about something. Johnny seemed worried and sad a lot of the time. And not just because he got his hair cut at home, which looked good. He was a man of the house. Maybe he was sent to our door so he might be added to his route. Across the street in what seemed a large house with Peter W., an only child, he had a lot of nasty things from the war. You could buy that stuff from army surplus stores around Boston. Peter got twisted somehow. When my little brother was in the playpen out in the upper porch, Peter would taunt him, taunt him from the street. My brother didn't understand what was going on. We were allowed to have a dog in our rental. There were times she would come home shaking. Once with sawdust on her. Peter's father had a woodworking shop in their basement. I asked him if he took our dog to our basement, he got angry. My mother caught on and realized Peter wasn't a good influence and stopped me from playing with him. I was hurt and angry, but she was right. Whatever screwed him up probably has led, had him walked away somewhere by now, reverberations of the war. Our street intersected with an inclined street that ended on Commonwealth Avenue. There were a few shops across, and one was a meat shop. Sometimes my mother would send me down there to get something for dinner. The only person I ever saw in the place was the butcher who owned the shop. I'd tell him what was wanted, and he would always try to get me to, to buy something else, like a candy bar. At some point, I told my mother about this. She said she felt sorry for him and that he was trying to make a living and it was hard for him because a new supermarket had opened a few blocks down the street. 
he was gone before we moved away. There was a kid in my class whose father worked the marriage around at Norm Beacon Park at the end of Com Ave. The park was built to attract people from Boston in the late 19th century. They would get there by trolley cars running down the middle of the street built by land developers. It worked. There were many nice homes built along Com Ave, but the trolleys were long gone because the people were now driving cars. The park had carnival-type rides, paddle boats for the river, popcorn and cotton candy. And the Penny Arcade was a creepy gypsy woman automaton that would tell your fortune in an unnerving voice after you put a coin in. This was a popular place, but it too was gone, replaced by a chain hotel. I thought my friend's father had a prestigious job running the merry-go-round. I thought again about that after going to their apartment for the first time. It was a warm day and his father was shaving in one of those undershirts with straps so that his upper body hair showed. My friend's mother was distraught. She kept at him while he was shaving. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph this and Ralph that. Her voice was breaking. She looked at me, she, he looked at me from the mirror a couple of times, expressionless. I think it was about money. My friend looked uncomfortable. It worried me and I never went back there again. I think I know what would have happened if I hadn't been there. Reverberations of the war. But it reminds me of the first time I heard my mother and stepfather play. Those images are burned and hard and can't be forgotten. I was in bed and suddenly they were yelling just outside my door by the bedroom. He threw his electric razor on the floor and it smashed into pieces. I can still see the light from the hallway coming in under the door. I was terrified, frozen. And I knew that a pool of blood would come seeping under into my room. I thought one of them would be dead. But he stormed out, and I finally got the courage to open the door and find my mother crying in bed with a book in her hands. I can't remember much of what she said, except she was sorry I had to hear this. Uh, she was hurt and embarrassed and couldn't comfort me much. I went back to bed sobbing myself. Nothing was said in the morning. This area was very Catholic by way of Italians and Irish. It was a newly built church where my friends went, Corpus Christi. At that time, I wanted to be Catholic, not just to belong and for the malignously authoritative sound of Latin, but it was the mystery of it all. My friends had these medals of saints that were blessed. They wore them on their baseball caps. Dear St. Christopher, protect us. How could I compete against these guys with the power of magic saints? Now after a year of revelations of child abuse by priests in the Boston Archdiocese, I'm glad I wasn't raised Catholic. Nobody was listening. Reverberations of the war. The day of the killing, my uncle dropped by and my mother sent him to find him in the woods near the river. On his way, he was hard bitten in his leg by a German shepherd named Tasker. The dog left us kids alone, but he didn't like men, and maybe he sensed my uncle was once a soldier. He never found me that day because the bike was so bad he had to go home. I was in the woods with a friend, playing war, probably fighting the Japs. We were running around and got to the water's edge, and there on the other bank was the mother and her babies. I was challenged to see how close I could come to them with a rock, I picked one up, let fly. One was hit and went upside down in the mud. The noise was terrible. Mother Mallet went berserk, quacking, flying all around, and the chick was crying and trying to upright itself. We ran like hell, and I got far enough away to feel safe, dropped to our knees, and prayed not to get caught, and that that chick would be all right. We probably bargained for our souls and promised to be good from then on in, too. Reverberations of the war. We lived there for two years, and then we too were gone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's always really interesting to hear about a certain time, uh, especially when you're right there with the person who wrote it. Yeah. You know, it just it, it just makes the history more real, and I find that interesting to learn about what it was like at this particular time. So I like all that. My first question is, what what was the killing? 
Well, it, it's, it's kind of like a series of memory vignettes, and uh, the killing specifically was uh, about the, the duck, the chick. Okay. But, Oh, I thought there was a human killer. I know, I did too. again, goddess, the human <laughs> Jed, is, Jed is precious. She's precious also. But she, she gets his. What's happy in the story? I thought there was the, okay. the malefactor. No, but happy the not happy I'm about that. I'm sitting about in the middle, so you're both right. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. Yeah. High five. <laughs> High five, Jed. Right. Um, High five. Well, the, the other killing was, was more of um, a theme. Mm -hmm. War reparation yeah. for the war. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Certain aspects of childhood dying, mm -hmm. and and other kind of things. That once we looking back, reflecting on them, um, just seemed like certain things had died. Mm -hmm. at that point. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned the summary that you were in sixth grade. The narrator, protagonist, sixth grade. If it's not you. Uh, and I suggest that you give a time stamp of some sort, have a historical event, or have a birthday party, have something at the start of the story itself, in well, case we're going to give you all 50, our notes. Right? We're going to give you all our notes. Yes, we'll give you all our notes. So you may want that within. And I'm not sure if this is historical fiction or a memoir, and you want to decide, because if it is historical fiction, I would have scenes, more scenes, with the um, uncle, because uh, he did come back a changed man. Uh, more with the neighbors, uh, and I think your story starts right here at the bottom of, just my opinion, the bottom of page, uh, paragraph two. At the end of my street, just before the river was the woods, it was down there that the killing happened. Boom, you got me. I want to hear. Jen, I love you. Well, I want to hear. And I lived in, I know Armadale. I, I live right down there, yes, I know exactly that area. The thing is, if you think about st starting the story there, that's only if the killing is a killing. Yes, yes, yes. Right? But yes. the killing really isn't a killing. It's um, aspects of childhood dying. So I don't know that you need to start there unless that's where, unless it was a physical thing that had actually mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, in the first paragraph when we get in, um, we, at the movies and on television we watched our, how our guys won the war. They had been home for a while but not saying much about it. I added a sentence, first draft, I don't know if that's because they didn't want to or because no one wanted to hear about it. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know what you were thinking when, you know, you, they had been hot home for a while but not saying much about it. Why do you think they weren't saying much about it? Or what was going on in your mind as a reaction to that? So that was why I added the, the sentence like that, to think about, why, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> <laughs> the sentence is so glaringly obvious. They didn't talk about it. The end. Uh, they just came back from war. Why wouldn't they talk about it? It was horrible. Yeah. It was just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of uh, the same boat. I grew up in the 50s, too. Uh, and uh, every father that I knew was in World War II in some capacity. None of them spoke about it unless they were in the KP or they were uh, serving food. And the guys on the front line never said anything. Yeah, I had the same experience. Especially in Normandy. I, I had an uncle that, I, it was only when, when I was an adult that I found that he was at Normandy. And yeah. when he told me Nothing. some of the experiences that he had, it was like, I had no idea. I had no, no idea. idea how and horrible had, it was. I had four other, other uncles who were also in combat. It was the same thing. None of them would say a word of it. Because all we, you know, all we ever saw were these sanitized versions. John Wayne, yeah. Russia yeah. the yeah. Beach. Exactly. And was he it's soft and kind and paternal, this uncle? Was he, did he still have his kindness and his Oh, yeah. He was, a, he was a terrific guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to imagine this person, this nice person, in a situation like yes. this, it's like, wow. Horrific. Yeah, it goes on today, too. Uh, I, I had a friend who was a, a Green Beret in Vietnam early in the war. And then he came to teach at my school, and he taught me. And I said, uh, and this is now 20 years later, I said, uh, I understand you were a they used to get dropped into the front lines. Could we talk about your experiences uh, in the war? I, I'm fascinated. It was too soon. Yeah. 20 years later, too soon. I don't think he ever talked about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that sentence says, uh, it, it's, at least for me, that sentence says plenty. Yeah. And that's one of the things about this. I can't change anything, because this is not a, 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 a fiction. This is real. And how can I challenge something that is real? This is a, I, I change some of the wording of sentences and so on, but 
but I'm not going to add to that. These are real uh, uh, people who do this at a time like this are are only real time machines. They take us back to a time that is not real in Hollywood or even in novels. These are real experiences. And how, how do you how do you say, oh no, this is wrong? It just can't be, as far as I'm concerned. I mean that's. So, uh, well, so I, I, did, I didn't grow up in that. I grew up with um, men just who were in kid. Vietnam. You're just a kid. Right? But no, but I did grow up with men who were in Vietnam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, very much the same thing. Um, or maybe it was. Yeah, I don't know. Very don't much know. the same thing. But, Robert, what I, what I would say is is first that your your protagonist here is a 12-year-old child, right? Sixth grade, yeah. around 12, right? Um, and the way I'm reading this is I, I feel like it's a, little, a series of little vignettes, um, little character sketches. And I think each one of them could be a 10-page story. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is an outline um, yes. because it's, it's, it's an extremely emotional topic, no doubt. Um, and I want, I want, I wanted more. Yeah. I wanted, I kept writing, elaborate, elaborate. Yeah. I wanted, there's a lot of, um, you know, in, in writing they say show, don't tell. You're, you're telling us a lot and not showing us a lot. But you're making me want to see it. Right, so I think there's enough here that makes me say, I want to see that fight. What were his mother and yes. stepfather fighting yes. about? Yes. Yes. What were they fighting about that was so horrible? I want to know, what was that kid, that bully, saying to his little brother? Mm -hmm. What What was he saying? Like, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted more. I, I want each of these kids. Like, what was going on with his friend's house with the father shaving? What see, were they fighting about? Was he, beating? Please, was he beating his wife? Like... He, he, all this is, is that I think I know what was going to happen, mm -hmm. but I don't. And the only thing I can go with is, okay, he's probably he's going to beat the crap out of his wife and his kid. But these are very emotional. Each one, a little vignette that has so much potential to be extremely emotional in each of them. And I liked the way you ended it. There's this, this kid, he's a bully. Something happened to him, reverberations of the war. This, this, these parents fighting. Marriages breaking up or beatings, you know, reverberations of the war. I, I think that um, it's a great start, and I think you should just take each paragraph and write. Elaborate, yes. And elaborate because, on, yes. on each, hate, on each one. I hate this. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> you write know, the story. It hates the agreement aspect. I completely agree. Happens. It's a... Uh, I'm going to put up a flat. Oh, no. Mark this day. <laughs> <laughs> on the yeah, Portland Library. You've... Uh, suggested many fascinating topics, and Jen's right. Elaborate, just yes. yeah. Yeah. bring us closer. You know, she to hear what you <laughs> I agree with you. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it was Jen's yeah, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> but only in Maine. You've not been right in Massachusetts. I've never been right in Yeah, I felt the same kind of thing. I felt uh, when I was reading this, I felt a real conflict because I felt as a short story, it's like it's bursting to explode out of a short story. It's like there. Is, you know, I wrote here, you have more to say than a short story. Yes, yes. Um, here, here. Each of these, Each of these paragraphs is a chapter uh, in, a, in a book, mm -hmm. easily. And uh, it, there's just more. Uh, I, I want to hear more about each of, the, each of these things. I mean, if I, see, if I looked at this as a short story, I would say, hmm, you've got problems here. Because with a short story, you want to get to the action pretty quick. Because people have short attention spans. I'm sorry, what, would you just say something? <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you watch it when it comes out. Uh, I mean, when you get, you know, you're not till, you know, page four, and, you know, before you get into the killing, and it's like nobody's going to go to page four. You know, no one's going to go to page one. And that, but that is if you insist on it being a, a short story, and that's what I'm saying. I don't think, yeah, I don't think you've got a short story. I think you have. The summary, as Jen said, of a larger work. And we're all saying that we want to hear more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, it's very mm -hmm. interesting to hear about what the details are and what all the emotion is behind mm -hmm. this. And if it's a memoir, that's okay. You still put in all the dialogue, the mm -hmm. story. It's, still it's, scenes. it's all scenes and the dialogue, whatever you can remember. That would make it it doesn't even have to be accurate, though. That's right. right. It doesn't make it close enough to yeah. it. Right. That's yeah. right. possible. I want to also, you know, we're talking about 
um, telling versus showing. When we're saying overall, we want you to show us more. I just wanted to bring up a specific example of telling versus showing. So at the second page where they're saying, you're saying people fished, I changed it, so now I don't know. People fished in the Charles, oh, it's on the first page. People fished in the Charles River. No, keep going. Yeah, second paragraph. Second paragraph. It's up a bit. Second Where? paragraph. People fished. Okay, it's in the so, walking around oh, yeah. paragraph. So people fished in the shop. People fished there, but caught. Where is it? No, I'm losing People fished there. Oh, I really changed it. Sorry. People fished there, but caught mostly some fish. They were greedy and stupid and thrown on the banks to flop, die, and stink in the summer sun. So you're telling us they were greedy and stupid. But if you change it to people fished in the Charles River catching mostly sunfish, the fishermen tossed the fish on the banks to flop, die, and stink in the summer sun. It tells us they're already not caring. Just they tossed it, they didn't care. And then they're dying there. So I know that's a minor example that took me forever to get to. Well, it but also says greedy and stupid and thrown, and I'm talking about people that fish. Right, so that's what I said. I said the fish greedy or the yes. people greedy. I said that. I know. Right. So it's a little uh, yeah, okay. place on fire. Yes. But sometimes there are just examples of where you. When you're showing it enough that they're doing it, you don't have to also tell at the same time. Does that make sense? I put that in there as an example. But I, I, I would definitely want to get the more details on what was really behind yeah. all of these fights. Like, what did that kid do to their dog? Yes! What did he do to their dog? Yeah. I don't know. Come I mean, in you know what, a lot of this might be, we might never learn that. Mm -hmm. We might never learn what happens to the dog. No, like, they could be but, it, but it could be a bigger, a bigger scene. And you're also, you're also talking about how the, the world is changing, like the transition from a butcher shop to a supermarket. I mean, that's a bit, you know, again, you, know, you, Dave, and I lived through this, and, you know, sort of the transition between small mom and pop grocery stores to supermarkets. It's a tremendous change in the world, and the way that you relate to things, the way, you know, your, your neighborhood is. Uh, and, and you're showing that. So, again, it's uh, the kind of thing where this can be over. And the trolley in Nuremberg Park you know, to draw people from the city to right. the suburbs. And the demise of Nuremberg Park and all. Right. Yes. What a great place that was. I remember the Penny Arcade. I don't remember the individual yeah. fortune teller, but you could spend a, a, a part of an afternoon in there with the dollars <laughs> worth of pennies. It was wonderful. Wonderful. That paragraph, I can be technical for a moment, on page three, uh, is awfully long. The one that starts, there was a kid in my class, and he goes on to talk about the park. So uh, I just wrote a note for you to break up the paragraph. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a, a mis misplaced yeah. modifier. Uh, the park was built to attract people from Boston in the late 19th century. Were the people from Boston in the late 19th century or the park was built in the late 19th century? There's just a few phrases. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know what I Yes. Uh, you know how at the beginning, I can't find it right now, but at the beginning where you say that was when the killing happened. Don't you say that's a bottom of paragraph two? Yep. Walking around. Walking around. Walking around. Walking around. Yep. All right. So I can't find it, but <laughs> we will. Yeah. Second paragraph. Oh yeah. So when you say where is it? Bottom where you say where the killing was happened? Oh, it was down there that the killing happened. I I could be totally off, but that kind of hinted to me that there was going to be a killing, and then of course it was the duck. And the duck seemed all right. The duck was waddling. I don't know if the death, I, I happen to think it was people, but if this is more about the killing of a lot of different moments and childhood moments, I don't think I would point to that's when the killing happened, because sure. that's not when the killing happened. The killing happened here and here and here and here. It was like a slow process. Mm -hmm. So if you take out that line, it gives it more of that feeling. Yes. Otherwise, it makes it seem like a specific event. I, I liked when Ed pointed out reverberations as emphasis, but I didn't like reverberation. I just I've noted how many times you used it, and maybe you could have another death, another demise, another sorrow, something else declining. Maybe that's but you're saying these are all demise. Demise. These are all yes. pieces. Yes. Yes. Every single fight yes. is a demise. Right. That could be your every kid that became a bully, every kid that lost a parent, right. right. every right. refrain. Like that. The refrain. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. And if you take out that that thing about the killing, it doesn't make it so concrete because it's really everything about the whole story. I really like that. Mm -hmm. So. Do you have questions for us? It has great potential, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no questions, but uh, uh, gratitude 
Thanks a lot. What do you think? Do you think you do? You, are you, do you Would you expand plan on leaving it like this? Do you think you want to go back and try to expand on any of it? Um, and if so, can I pick which part? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even get a choice. You are expanding. And she knows who she wants to play the movie. <laughs> yeah. Sue has an agenda for that. Wait, well, we cast a movie. That's a fee. We do this stuff for nothing. But yeah. when we start casting, okay. okay. Sue, so what do you think? <laughs> What do you think? What do you no, want to no, say? I want to know what you're thinking. Well, this, this was, to be honest, was a kind of a moment of catharsis um, of just a point in time in my life when um, then certain, uh, as I said, certain kind of, they were mostly kind of vignettes of memory at a certain point in time, and they just uh, were there kind of one morning, uh, mm -hmm. including uh, the so-called voice here. So. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of um, trying to get that out, and uh, uh, the first piece of um, fiction, or shall I say, non-business type writing I've done. So um, it, it was just a way to reflect and, and try to piece something back. And I had been thinking about um, just a, a kid growing up outside uh, outside of Boston, and it. You know, on, on one hand, there just seemed to be uh, that kind of leave it to beaver scenario that we all thought we were kind of living through, mm -hmm. but there was a kind of a deep, darker undertow that was going on at that time that uh, didn't seem to be, well, I guess for me, didn't seem to be there even though it actually was. So it's also in the sense, I guess, is that how uh, kids can kind of tune things out that they don't want to recognize or live with. And, well, that the parents sheltered. Maybe it's that your parents sheltered you. That's beautiful. Well, it, it, it also shows it's not invisible. It was there, just waiting to come out. Yeah. And uh, when you uh, when it stuck its head out, you grab it, and it sounds awfully good. Yes, I, mean, I want to consider that. Then, even if you hadn't planned on going further with it, you might want to consider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take your time. Just, just pick the scene with the uncle. What he finds. No, I want the scene with the parents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what that. I want to know about. Yes. <laughs> Peter W. Uh, thanks Sorry. for coming today. Yeah, I have an assignment. Okay. You do. You have an assignment. <laughs> There's a completion date involved. Anyway, I have to do it. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is uh, the end of this episode of Writers and Music. Keep writing. <laughs>